I would like to introduce today's commencement speaker. Gandhi wrote, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I think this speaker really exemplifies somebody who's attempting to do that. So the commencement speaker today is Mr. Steve McCormick. He is a president and um, board of trustees member of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which forms and invests in partnerships to achieve significant, lasting, and measurable results in environmental conservation and science. For 30 years, Mr. McCormick has dedicated his career to the preservation of our planet through a variety of positions related to environmental law and policy. Steve began his career with the Nature Conservancy, also known as TNC, one of the premier international environmental organizations whose mission is to preserve the planets, animals, and natural communities that represent the diversity of life on Earth. Mr. McCormick began as the legal counsel for the western region of TNC and then rose through the ranks to spend 16 years as executive director of the California State Program. In, in that role, he led an organization-wide effort that created conservation by design, the strategic framework that now guides all of TNC's work in 29 countries and every state in the United States. Eventually, Mr. McCormick became president and CEO of the entire organization, and he led the, T uh, the Nature Conservancy into a truly global presence. During his tenure, he oversaw the operating budget of over 500 million and a highly distributed staff of over 3,000. Steve McCormick has been a member of several boards, including the Hi advisory board of the Harvard Business School Social Enterprise Initiative, as well as the advisory board of the UC Berkeley College of Natural Resources. He's also the rep recipient of several conservation awards, including the Department of Interior Silver Award in 1986 and the Edmund G. Pat Brown Award for Sustainable Development. Steve completed his bachelor's degree in agricultural economics at the University of California, Berkeley, so another UC grad, and received his law degree from the University of California Hastings College of Law. It is a pleasure and an honor to present to you Steve McCormick. I invariably follow the shortest person on the stage, so it's going to take me a while to adjust this, and typically the next shortest person follows me. Um, I am, I'm very, very honored and delighted to, to, to join you today, uh, particularly the graduates of these programs. Um, I am a, um, an ardent and uh, passionate graduate of the University of California, and although for many sporting activities we have rivalries, I think the entire institution is one of the, one of the most profound and important in all the world, so I, I couldn't be more honored to join you. Um, delighted to see such a large turnout of parents, particularly facing into the sun. We're going to kind of watch you turn red as I'm standing up here. Um, when I was invited to give this um, commencement address, I told a friend of mine, I was very proud that I was going to come here, give the commencement <coughs> address. He was a graduate of UCLA, and he said, you're going to give the address to the whole school? I said, no, actually, Bill Clinton's going to do that. <clears throat> and he said, well, you know, that's, uh, you're going to be overshadowed by Clinton. Everybody's going to want to see him, but not you. So, so <clears throat> <clears throat> I pulled a few strings, called a few people, and... <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> um, yeah, one of the challenges of giving an address like this is, you know, what are you going to say that hasn't been said before? What are you going to say that really is personal and genuine and inspiring? I, I, in all candor, I can't remember who spoke at my graduation, let alone what they said. Um, so I thought, I thought, well, maybe I'll go listen to some people give commencement addresses. And just last week, I was invited to participate in a graduation of the National Cathedral School. It's an all-girls school in uh, Washington, D.C., and the commencement speaker was uh, Condoleezza Rice. And she said, um, follow your passion. Which, I, I, I had two thoughts. One was, that's what all commencement speakers say. It just seemed kind of threadbare and tried and a little overused. And secondly, I thought, 
maybe you shouldn't follow your passion every time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe it should be temper your, temper your inclinations or um, check the data or something. But, <clears throat> <clears throat> but that, that would be too sort of downbeat for a commencement address. In any event, what, <clears throat> what I wanted to share with you today is an outlook that I have for where the world is today. And again, this will sound uh, very recycled, but I mean it really, 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 really very genuinely and, and very personally because I have been in my career now for over 30 years. And I am convinced that the world is at a remarkable threshold of opportunity. Now again, probably all commencement speakers say something like, well, what commencement speaker would say, the world is pretty stable, everything's organized, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, go out and uh, have a good time. Uh, <laughs> I think, and I really mean this, that you graduates are in a position to take advantage of where the world is today. And as Victoria said, never before in my, in my life, certainly, and I don't think in, in modern time, never before has the world really become so acutely aware of the prominence, importance of the environment. So what I want to do is, is give you mostly an outlook, but I'm going to get there by tracing a little bit of the past. It's important to understand how we got to where we are today. This country in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, had a sort of similar transformation of thinking when the notion of creating protected areas was advocated by John Muir and then carried by people like Theodore Roosevelt. That was a radical idea at the time. We take it for granted now, but in a country that had been devoted since its inception to conquering the wilderness, to converting and transforming, to, talk about arrogant, reclaiming nature for human use, for people to suggest that we should actually set places aside and save nature was really quite radical. And so to make the case those people had to portray nature in almost spiritual and divine terms. So the, the images we see from that period and the language we hear uh, from those days is exalted. It's reverential. The portrayal of nature was as something divine. And if you look at early pictures, and even more recently in the photographs of Ansel Adams, nature is distant. It's majestic, but it's removed. It's grand, it's not personal, and there's seldom anyone in it. And you'll hear John Muir talk about the glory of nature, and you'll hear others talk about the, the uh, almost metaph metaphysical dimensions and attributes of nature. And that worked. I mean, it got people's attention, and the language we used in this country to really move forward were things like set aside, save, protect, secure. It was a language we had to use. That was an enormously successful idea. There's not a country in the world that I'm familiar with, even the poorest, most underdeveloped countries, have some form of protected area systems at a national scale. So you had this idea which was radical and it became mainstream. Over time, however, and more recently because of the, of the really fine input from conservation biologists, we realized the severe limitations of that philosophy and that idea. Most of the parks that have been created were at the time very distant and remote and so there was no awareness of what would happen over time as human activity crept up against the borders of protected areas. And indeed when that happened, the limitations of those places became very starkly and soberingly real. You look at Yellowstone National Park in this country, the boundaries are very linear. Wildlife, natural phenomena have no appreciation for what's inside the park and what's outside the park. So we realized that the scale we were working at was insufficient and so was the design of a lot of protected areas. Conservation biology gave us a greater insight into the dynamics of natural systems and realized we needed to work at a much, much larger scale. And as I say, human activity created a sense of limits it also created a sense of the real value and the trade-offs we make in establishing protected areas. And so we began to see a kind of evolution in the movement, if you will, towards thinking about harmony with nature, to thinking in terms of having parks understood in a, in a, in a nested area of used or managed landscapes. And it was almost this notion of detente. You know, okay, well, nature's there and we want to make sure we don't intrude on it. But it was still separate from humans. 
and we still use the same language, set aside, save, protect, secure. Gradually, however, and again through the work of, of, of many people who have had backgrounds like you graduates, greater appreciation develop not just for nature, for nature's sake, but nature as the wellspring of human well-being. And the, the most recent expression of that notion was in something called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It was a project done under the auspices of the United Nations, done by 1,300 preeminent scientists, people who had no political agenda, who knew the biology and physical dimensions of the natural landscape, came together to sort of analyze what's the status of the world's ecosystems. And they came up with a startling and I think highly unexpected conclusion. The expected conclusion was, well, they'll say that the ecosystems of the world are in decline and we need to do something about that. We've been hearing that for a long time, so what? Well, they said that, but they said a lot more. They said, and the, this is the first key finding in the report of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Everyone, now this is scientists. Scientists usually hedge their language a little bit. You know, science is a pursuit of truth. Nothing is ever an absolute. This is an absolute and unequivocal statement you will hear from a group of scientists. And this was a consensus report. Everyone in the world, ev everyone in the world is dependent upon nature and ecosystem services to provide the conditions for a safe, healthy, decent life. Now, in that, simple but elegant statement is the genesis of a whole new idea, a whole new philosophy for conservation, an idea fitted for where the world is today and for the 21st century. Because it moves from the idea of creating isolated, protected areas that are saved from what? From people. And it establishes the notion that nature is imperative. It is a form of capital, if you will, for people. So let's think that through a little bit. If you go to a developed country, <clears throat> and I've spent much time in developing countries, advocating as I have had for, as I've done for many years, for the creation of protected areas, you're seeing, I have been seen as, I'm an interest group. And an interest group that is in no way addressing any of the needs of that country. And so I often get a polite audience, typically it's with a minister of environment, not the head of state, not the minister of finance. And they say, gee, I wish we could do more, but we have other things we need to do. And in fact, the language that we often use in the conservation community, which is derived from the early vision of John Muir and others, the language like set aside, protect, save, comes across as confiscatory, particularly to people living in those environments. And things that we regard in the developed world from the luxury of our lifestyle, things we regard as a crime, like poaching, are absolutely essential for people to, 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 to live in these places. And so we have now in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment the first declaration, if you will, of a whole new idea. And what happened, here's the, this, here's the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. I mean, that suggests we're not gonna have another for another thousand years. We gotta pay attention to this. And no one knows about it. So I encourage you to go look at it. They've got a great website. Because you can be the ones who take that idea and make it real, because it's still fairly theoretical. So what do we need to do to make it real? We need to start working with, we need to start working with those countries, those institutions, and those people, particularly local people, who are concerned about the basic elements of life on Earth. Here's a comment that I picked up from a recent uh, New York Times article uh, from Roberto Unger, who is the Minister of Strategic Affairs in Brazil. Very, very educated man, very articulate man. Now again, bear in mind that the world has been looking at the Amazon forest as a place to save, to set aside. And Mr. Unger says, noting a, a recent spike of deforestation, he says that a form of environmentalism that is not wedded to a coherent economic strategy for the occupation of the Amazon is self-defeating. That's an interesting comment. In other words, all the things that we as conservationists have been advocating for to save, protect, set aside, it's actually self-defeating. Not only is it gonna be on the margin, it's self-defeating. He goes on to say, the Amazon is not just a set of trees, it is a set of 25 million people, 
If we don't create real economic opportunities for them, the practical result is to encourage disorganized economic activities that results in the further destruction of the rainforest. But he does not claim to have the answers yet. This, he says, is an immense frontier of the imagination. And that's where we are today. We are on this frontier of an imagination, a whole new precept, a whole new idea that can be even more profound, even more far-reaching than the original idea of creating protected areas. What do we need to do? What can you do? We need to establish some real examples. What are these services? The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment talks about water not only clean and fresh water, but preventing flooding. That is a provision that nature provides. It talks about nutrient cycling. It talks about capture of carbon in forests. It talks about the need for uh, understanding how even the cultural elements of natural systems have a value. Maybe they are beyond monetary evaluation, but they are no less important as a consequence. We need good science to get in there and take this precept, prove it out. We need people to make alliances across traditional discipline boundaries. In my field, we've talked about good science informing our decision, but it's always been the biological science. We need social scientists. We need econo uh, the science of economics. We need to make trade-offs. This is not an all-or-nothing proposition. The comfort, frankly, of the philosophy of creating parks is it is an all-or-nothing proposition. You say, we want it all, we want it 100% conserved, or, or it's not good enough. But unfortunately, that's a losing proposition. And in the end, we won't get enough to secure the world's biological diversity at a scale that is in any way meaningful. We need to break out of our comfort zone. <clears throat> we need to think, as I say, beyond the traditional disciplines and philosophies that have guided the field of conservation for almost 100 years. We need to study the human dimension. This is, after all, about people. We're moving from a special interest to a human interest. We need to think about conservation then not as protecting and preserving natural features from people, but conserving it for them. Now, some people would consider that crass. They would consider it uh, too, um, too driven by a monetary value. But I would suggest not at all. It's driven by respect for human values. And unless we do figure out how to take this theory to practice, then not only will nature suffer, but humans will as well. I think then that uh, the message that I'd like to leave with you is that your generation can be remembered not just for what you create, but for what you refuse to destroy. Thank you very, very much.